The content you're about to enjoy comes from the archives of The Best You. We're devoted to the very best in personal development. With a magazine and resources dedicated to inspiring and changing people's lives, at The Best You, we work with the world's leading writers and trainers on the evolution of the self and people whose journeys have been affected by their work and words. For more information, go to www.thebestyou.co. Hey, everyone. Um, I'm Bernardo Moya. I'm the CEO of NLP Life Training and uh, the founder of The Best You. And I'm delighted and excited to have here today uh, Michael Neal. Hey, Michael, how are you? I'm well. Nice to see you. Uh, so, Michael, uh, for some of you that may not know, he's uh, an internationally renowned author, speaker, and thought leader, uh, challenging the cultural mythology uh, that stress and struggle uh, are prerequisite of, of, uh, to creativity and success. His best selling books, podcasts, keynotes, trainings, and retreats have inspired and impacted millions of people uh, around the world. Um, Michael's mission is to unleash the human potential with intelligence, humor. God knows we need it, and heart, and his unique uh, brand of loving disruption has made him a beloved catalyst and creative. Um, he, Michael's worked with so many great people, uh, and I was sharing this morning, Michael, uh, that my my particular uh, fond memories is obviously training with you many moons ago uh, when I did my NLP practitioner. Uh, yeah. Dr. Richard Bandler and, uh, and Paul McKenna and you. And I still have this anchor of you running on stage, left to right, right to left. Oh, your day. Put them on your day. What oh, an anchor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God, the anchor's still with me. It was brilliant. I still have so, so many great fond memories from then. Anyway, Michael, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Great to see you. Lovely to see you. No, it's funny. I just was texting with Paul just before coming on. We're, we're trying to plan a virtual cocktail for while I'm virtually in England. Okay. <laughs> That's great. Uh, so, Michael, uh, well, as I said, I mean, Ma- Michael's, you know, got a phenomenal career. And, and what I wanted to do, obviously, because we're using this also for, for our podcast, I, I wanted you to kind of explain a little bit more about where, where you were born, where you were brought up and, and your early years, you know, as, as you, as you, as you got into what you do today, tell us a little bit more about those early years. Well, they were pretty innocuous. I was, I was born outside of Boston, a little town called Shrewsbury, Massachusetts, and grew up there and had a, a, a remarkably unremarkable life, except for the fact that around the age of 13, I got, and I don't know what it, it I, I got suicidal depression. It, 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 it advanced over time. I don't think at 13, I was immediately at my worst, but 13 was when it started happening. The sort of overwhelm and weight of the world feeling like it was dragging me down. And, and bizarrely, I had an unremarkable teenage years anyways. You know, in other words, I sort of just thought that's how it feels. You always talk to people whose parents were in the military and they moved around all the time and they always go, it was just normal for us. Feeling as horrible as I felt was my normal. So it wasn't kind of as bad as if I'd had great times and then thought, what happened to the good stuff? And, and, and so that just interesting dichotomy of having a completely different inner life to my outer life. I mean, I had a family that loved and still loves me. I had, I had, I had, I had no complaints on the outside at all. And, and yet my inner world was turmoil. And I look back on it now, people say, do you think that was a, a gift that, that, that time? And I was like, no, <laughs> it was horrible. And, and it wasn't a gift because I wouldn't give it to my kids if I had a, a, a choice. But... I do often say it was the best thing that ever happened to me and I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. Mm. Like everything I have become, everything I am able to do, the, the enjoyment I have in life now, I think is largely a result of having started from so far down uh, that, that I, I just had to find a way up. And, and so I'm grateful for it. But I, I don't think of it as a gift. And, and is that what put you on the path of, of really, because I, I, you know you had a, a brief career in acting. Um, so was that and the study of learning more uh, around, you know, mind, mindset, 
and you know improving yourself and coming well, out. Well, yeah, the the acting thing for me. I mean, part of it was just I liked prattling about on stage, but but part of it was genuinely I was trying to understand what the hell is it to be a human being. Like, I don't know if it's an old soul thing, but that was on my mind from a really young age. Why are we here? Who are we? What is it all about? And, and acting was an interesting way to play with it because I, would, I could change things about myself, and yet I knew there was something that was constant. So I could have different hair and a, a different accent and, and say different things that I would normally do or say myself. And, and yet there was something in me that, that didn't change. And, and, and so that was sort of the beginning of the spiritual part of my quest. So there, I was, I was interested in all the, the personality and, and, uh, stuff that you could do, but I actually was also really interested in what the hell is it that isn't changing when all of the details of who I am seem to change. So it, it, it was kind of a, a, a great school for, for life pretending to be other people. Uh, and I learned a lot about human beings that way. And um, I mean, for, for me personally, I, I, I always used to read a lot of the greats, you know, uh, Napoleon Hill, uh, and, you know, I remember Robert Kiyosaki, Sharon Lecter, Rich Dad, Paul Dad, that was a book that had a big impact in me. Um, and, and obviously Brian Tracy, Jim Rohn, that there were so many greats, but it was NLP that put me on the, that really got my attention uh, as far as, you know, understanding more. And, and I realized how little I knew, you know, at the age of yeah. 38. What was, what was kind of a turning point, if any, for you uh, that, that put you on that path? Well, it was funny. The thing that got me into NLP was also the thing that took me out of it. The same incident, <laughs> in a funny way, 17 years apart. So I remember reading Unlimited Power. I was living in London and I, I worked at a bookshop um, called The Mystic Trader in Chalk Farm. And my, um, we were friends with the guys who ran Compendium. And these were like the two big alternative bookshops in London at the time, in the late 80s. And I remember going down to Compendium and asking Duncan, the guy who worked there, hey, what's new? And he said, oh, you got to read this book. It's by some guy, Anthony Robbins. He's a, it's, it's really cool. It's, it's, uh, it's about something called NLP. And I was like, okay, cool. And, and there was a exercise in like the second chapter of the book where he says, would you like to experience peace of mind? And I was like, yes, I would. And, and he said, well, reach up in your mind and turn down the volume knob on the voice inside your head. And I was like, I didn't know there was a volume knob. Okay, man, and look, and I, I kind of turn it down. And I honest to God experienced like profound quiet. The quiet that I now associate with meditation, with, with, with spiritual practice, with, with things that I wasn't interested in back then. And, and the next thing in the book was, Hey, if that, if you enjoyed that, I've got a million more techniques. And I was hooked. I was like, I want them all. I want every single one and I want to master them. And, I want to, and it was just, I was so hungry for peace of mind. I was so hungry for just being okay for a minute, for it not being so chaotic up here. And NLP just gave me instant access in a way that I had never dreamed of. And, and the reason that I say that it's also what took me out of it was I, I had an absolute, for lack of a better word, epiphany in 2008 where I, I was listening to this Scottish mystic named Sidney Banks. And he said, he was giving a talk and I was, I was literally half paying attention, half drinking a beer, waiting for a baseball game to come on television because I was away training. And I heard him say, every human being is sitting in the, in the middle of mental health. They just don't know it. Mm. And I heard that so deeply that literally my life has never been the same since. I had that same experience of peace that I had when I first turned down the volume knob on the voice inside my head. But this time, 17 years later, I recognized it wasn't the technique the technique had given me access to something that was already a part of me. And I hadn't known that somehow. And literally it was the most bizarre thing 
I, up until that point, would have described myself, did describe myself as a really high-functioning, successful depressive. And I was. I, I was doing very well at work. I had a great marriage, a great family. I, I really did enjoy my life, given that I was probably at best two weeks away from falling back into depression at any moment if I didn't do all my techniques, if I didn't do my what I called behavioral Prozac. And in that moment, I just had this absolute knowing I, I was born happy. Like, Babies don't need therapy. And, and, and so I must have learned the unhappy bit later. And I, I don't know how to describe it. Now, hopefully, if, if somebody's listening to this and they have been depressed their whole life or anxious their whole life, they will find this hopeful instead of arrogant. But I was no longer a depressed person from that moment over. And I have never been since. I've had my downs but there are downs like I hear other people talk about them, like, ooh, I'm having a shitty day. Like they're not, they don't feel anything to do with who I am anymore. And, and, and I realized, and the, the reason I say it took me out of NLP was because I realized that had the next sentence in that Tony Robbins book not been, you like that? I got a million more of them. But hey, if you like that, good news. That's who you already are it would have just taken my life in a very different direction. So I have the utmost gratitude for NLP, for, 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 for you, for Paul, for Richard, for, for, for not only what I learned, but just the sheer fun. I don't know that I can look back on a period of my life that was more fun than the five years we were all teaching together. Mm -hmm. Like that was just, Paul always talks about it as, man, we got to get the band back together. <laughs> it was, it was like that. But I'm equally grateful to have seen that I don't need fixing and neither does anybody else. And I really didn't know that. And I really do know that now. It is said that we live in a world our questions create. And it's true. Those that have succeeded in life, those that stand out, those that have made a difference, those that are inventing, those that are exploring, pushing the boundaries of reality are based on those that have asked themselves empowering questions. In my new book, The Question, Find Your True Purpose, I help you find your true purpose, find your legacy. For more information, go to www.thequestion.co. If you're interested in working with me, contributing, speaking at any of our many events, partnering or licensing The Best You, for more information, go to www.thebestyou.co. Well, it, it came across that way, uh, that it was a lot of fun when you guys were training. Um, I also wanted to add that I thought your impersonation of Tony Robbins' of voice was really good, uh, Michael. Thank, and, you, uh, thank you very much. I, I was an actor. I did. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Uh, so, yeah, and, uh, and, and this fixing part uh, about, uh, you know, kind of, for me, I was, I was, I didn't go, there was only, I needed fixing, it was more about how I wanted to, enhance my skills and i'll be honest it was it was purely professional i was there to say okay what can i learn that i could teach my team so they could build better rapport because i heard all this rapport and mirroring and all these yeah. things and i thought you know as i did a lot of sales and marketing courses but i remember standing in the middle of the room and i was aware of how aware i was for the first time in my in my life mm. so the word awareness is always key for me yeah. um, and, and that internal dialogue but but it is quite basic is a lot of people don't know that they actually have a knob, and I mean the. the, the knob. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying, Bernardo. I wanted to clarify. <laughs> so um, that's the basic, isn't it, Michael? Because I, I've always said this: that you know what, you can do as many courses as you want, you can read as many books as you want, but if you're not aware of what you're aware, of, if you're not aware of your internal dialogue, you can start managing it. So it's helpful, you know. You're not well, really you know, I've gone. A, I've gone a slightly different way with it. I think if you're not aware that it's there then yeah, you're totally a victim of it. Mm -hmm. But what I've seen is I, I don't particularly need to manage it any more than I need to manage a TV in a bar that's on in the corner. Like, I don't care if it's on a news channel I like, a news channel I don't like, a sports team I like, a sports team I don't like, a daytime talk show. Like, I, I don't have to pay attention to it. Mm. Now, every now and again, I get sucked into it and distracted by it and riled up by it and all that. But most of the time, it's just a TV that's on in the corner. 
and, and I don't need to get the bartender over and make him change the channel. Um, all my metaphors are alcoholic, which is weird because it's very early here, but, but, but bear with, right? Like, like it, it, really, it really was sort of revelatory to me that, that I didn't need as much managing as I had thought. Mm. And again, remember, I was coming from an extreme. So for me, it was like I had to, I remember a book, you can't afford the luxury of a negative thought. And I, it was like, okay, I've got to be on top of every thought coming through my head. And so for me, I think I kind of, I just went the other way to pure freedom. I kind of made a deal with my brain and I said, hey, whatever you want, go for it. I, I, you're on your own, like ha have at it. I'm not going to mess with you anymore. And what happened to my pleasant surprise is it started managing itself. Like I started noticing me angering myself frustrating myself, discouraging myself, winding myself up, creating drama, doing all this stuff. And as soon as I'd notice it, it would be like, oh, you don't want that? Oh, okay. Like I, I, I stopped having to intervene. And I think I had just never left it long enough to see that there's kind of a self-correcting mechanism built into the system. And I think what what I still love in the work that, that we did in NLP is the optimization where you can play with things and create these, these richer internal experiences. But I was, had always come at it from how do I fix what's broken? And, and, and for me, that's why it was life-changing to realize that no, no, nobody is. And when you, when you coach people, now and, and 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 you've obviously built a phenomenal amount of content books uh, you've been very generous ahead of the game i remember you and your blog when you started uh, you know your cafe um pretty much just after the internet started i'm only joking but you know kind of a well, long no, time but it was, i remember my son who was like i mean he was pretty young saying daddy how many people read your i didn't even call it a blog i didn't know what a blog was but you know how many people read your thing and and i said oh i don't know like 12 it were like 12 14 000 people at that time it was it was it was sort of in its first or second year and he said um he said you should charge them all a dollar you'd be rich <laughs> and it was funny because it had never even occurred to me <laughs> like like i literally it, it had never occurred to me as part of the business i just wanted to my, my mind is like a creativity factory. And, and so if I don't get stuff out, it kind of backs up. Like, I don't yeah. know if you remember the episode of I Love Lucy where they're, 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 she's taking the chocolates off the conveyor belt and they get behind and it just turns into a big mess. Like, that's the inside of my brain. And so putting that stuff out every day was a way for me to clear my mind as much as anything else. And then later I realized, oh, people really like this and it's helpful to them. And, oh, I could build a business from this. And so I did. And you've been very generous with the content that you have. And I'm, and I'm excited that we've got it now on, on the Bistro Online and, and, you know, people can come and, and, and sign up for it because, you know, you, you, you've, you've created so much. And a lot of the things that I, I started, so with, with your blog and everything, but then I remember when you started coaching coaches, you know, for people yeah. to become coaches and, and obviously to, to have the skills that it takes to become a great coach. What does it take to become a great coach? Because obviously you've written super coach, but what does it, what does it take to become a great coach? Well, the, the, the surprising thing that I've learned now in teaching coaches for, I mean, I've been coaching for 30 years, but I think I've been teaching coaches for maybe 15 of those years. It feels about right. Might be, a, it, it might be a little longer. If you really, really care about people, you can become a great coach. If you don't, I really don't think that you can. I, I, you can be clever. You can, you can be a consultant and give advice. But there's a human dimension in coaching that, that no amount of training or technique can, can overcome. If you don't like people, just get, get a job that doesn't involve people. There are, they're out there. Like, a lot of them. Um, you know, and, and it takes care of a host of things like rapport. Well, if you really care about people, they tend to fall into rapport with you because they can tell that you care. You, you know, so many of the techniques that we learn are, are, are to make up for that missing genuine 
care if you can let it be about them. I mean, that's helpful. <laughs> right? The number of coaches who are so in their head trying to make sure they're doing a good job and earning their money. And it's like, who cares about you? This isn't about you. This is about them. Right. And, and so it, it, it's, it's funny that it's that simple. And of course there are skills. And of course there, there are so, I always tell, tell students, there's a science and an art and I can teach you the science in an, in, in a relatively short amount of time, but the art, you've got your whole life to develop. And, and, and so that's, that's what I do when I work with coaches, I teach them the science, like how the mind works and how success works and, and how we create things in the world and how we stop ourselves and all that good stuff. But the actual sitting down with another human being and helping them, that's an art form. And, and like any art form, it takes time to, to develop a, a, a unique voice and mastery with it. Mm. Great. That is great. Uh, and it's so true, Michael. Well, it, it, not only with coaches, it's, it's obviously, you know, for people that show that they care, it, it is about listening and it's about being, you know, kind of understanding what people are saying. And, and sometimes, you, you know, I mean, when you're speaking to someone, you know, they've asked you a question, they're already on the next question. They're not even listening to your answers. And, and that, that's- You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell a little, because I know we have some people from, from the band, and I want to tell a story on Richard. And, and I'm saying this knowing that, you know, Richard can kill me at any moment, but he, he won't because this was when I first, the, the very first week that I did the, NLP, the big NLP training with, with Paul and Richard, I didn't know Richard. I'd met him once like in 1993 or something. And we started teaching in 2003 and, and I just heard all sorts of things about him. A lot of people in the NLP community at that time didn't, were, were not fans of his and I didn't know him. Well, I walked into the green room on about the fourth day of the training, uh, you know, where, where we hung out upstairs and Richard was in the room on his own with a stack. Cause there must've been 500 people on the training of certificates. And he was going through one by one and signing them. And I was, I don't, I don't even know why I thought that he must've had somebody to sign his signature or stamp them or something. Cause he's worked with so many thousands of people, but I kind of blurted out before I could stop myself you sign the certificates yourself. And, and, and he just looked at me in that great Richard way, you know, the glare. And he said, and then he, he went, I don't only sign them. I love them. And, and he, he, he was talking about just putting energy into every single certificate. Mm. And I, I've never forgotten that because for, for all the bluster and all the, the brilliance Underneath that, I think one of the reasons Richard has had such an impact in the world is because he cares about people as deeply as anyone I have ever met. Mm. And I think we overlook that. It gets, it gets kind of hidden behind the brilliance. To find out about my latest projects, get a free coaching lesson or download my book, go to www.bernardo-moya.com. Absolutely. And it gets hidden behind the genius. And a lot of the times, you know, um, yeah, no, I mean, that's been one of the, that's really, for me, the pleasure of working with him for so many years is, is, is seeing him perform because it is performing. You know, he goes on stage and, and he delivers and it doesn't matter. You're always going to get some golden nugget at some point, which like, boom, goosebumps. So no, I, I've, I've, I've had the pleasure of, of seeing that many times. Michael, you were talking about creativity and, and obviously kind of discussing a little bit kind of the current situation where we are now i have this sense i mean you know I, i'm norm, I'm, I'm pretty much like you i'm extremely creative i need to kind of i've always got like 17 projects going on at the same yeah. time um do you have this sense of i i have a sense in particular that there's so much so much is being created at this point right now there's so many people thinking because they've never stopped to think maybe or you know had the time yeah are you feeling it and are you more creative than, than before as well? Oh, it, it, it's, my wife is just pissed off with me because I'm literally every day I'm up in the office going, oh, hang on, baby, I'm just starting a new, uh, a new Instagram live series. Oh, hang on, baby, I'm just writing a, a blog post for Thrive. Oh, hey, hey, hang on, baby, I just created a new program with Robert Holden. Oh, hey, and I mean, literally almost every day, some new ideas coming through that I'm like, oh, that's great. I should, and and because I don't have any reason not to, we're just doing it. And, mm. and, and, you know, my business partner at one point said, you know, do you think any of this is going to work? And I'm like, I don't care. 
Like, it's really exciting. It's really fun. Somebody's going to find it helpful. And the stuff that takes on a life of its own will do more of. And, and so, yes, I do think there is a real opening for creativity right now. And it's partly time, right? You know, we don't have the commute. We're out of the routine. The normal is done. So it opens us back up to what um, the artist Michelle Cassou calls point zero, which is the point where you could go in any direction. So most people try to be creative, but they're already in a funnel. They're already, well, I want to be creative in this direction. And there's only so much you can do in the narrow confines of that. But every time you go back to point zero, you open it up. It's like, oh, a whole new set of possibilities comes through. And I think that's, you know, in, in the bio you read, the phrase loving disruption is one that I use a lot with coaches. Because until you disrupt the routine, you're just going to get more of the same. But if you do it without love, it's really upsetting to have your routine disrupted. <laughs> and so I think that's why there are people right now who are coming alive and thriving. And I'm, I'm, I, I'm not, there are obviously people who are very sick. That's a different thing. But yeah. for those of us who are well, there, there are people who are, are shutting down and there are people who are expanding and you cannot shrink your way to success. It, it, you, it just doesn't work that way. So there's an incredible opportunity right now. Not, there's a great opportunity to get it on the ground. It's like, this is what we trained for, people. Yeah. This is what all that personal development work we did was for, to thrive when the circumstances aren't optimal. I love the wedding vows. 30 years married this year, and we're just realizing we're not going to get to go on a freaking trip but because it's next month. But I love that it's for better and for worse, for richer and for poorer, in sickness and in health. I want everything in my life to be that unconditional, including my creativity. Mm, I love that. I love that. Yeah, so true, Michael. And, and obviously the love aspect is so important, uh, putting the love in and, and the rest follows. You know, if you do it from a place of love, you know, um, it, and it's what's needed. So what, what is needed now? What do you think we need more of? What, what, are, what are you hoping is the outcome of, of this new new that we have? Yeah. Well, I think it's almost two different questions. So the first question, what do we need now? We, we need to calm the hell down. <laughs> right? Because it, it's, even if some of what we're looking at, it, it could be done better. And of course it could be. We're never going to make that happen from our own panic and anger. So, so that's the first thing. If we can calm ourselves and kind of get back to, actually, I'm okay, or I'm sick, but that's it. If we stop terrifying ourselves with, yeah, but with the economy and the this and the that, then we're just really, the opportunity is to be more present than you have ever been. Because I can pretty much promise you that anyone listening right now is okay. Right now. And when you start to see that the present moment isn't a static thing, it's a magic carpet ride. Like every time you get present, it's the magic carpet of possibility and creativity whisks you off and takes your mind to the next place. And all you've got to do to get on the magic carpet is get present. And I think we as a society are so not present to life. We're so in our thinking, not in our lives. We're so in our thinking about the game, not in the game. You can't play the game from the stands. You can take a 30 second time out, but most people are on a like 30 year time out. So we've got an opportunity to get present. We've got an opportunity to get in the game. We've got an opportunity to get out of our heads and into our lives to get on the magic carpet and to see where it takes us. Like we don't even have to predetermine it because that's really hard right now because we don't know what the future is going to look like. Mm. But fortunately, we don't have to. Yeah. yeah. Love it. No, absolutely. Um, so with the, with the idea uh, around uh, fear, because there's a lot of people that are very, very fearful, yeah. their jobs, you know, the, the idea of having to start all over again, doing something completely yeah. new. 
Any advice on that? Well, I actually do. And I'm ultimately qualified for this because I am the most frightened person I've ever met. Like I, 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 my default is like, I'm a little rabbit, you know, it's like, <laughs> you know, and, 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 you know, it never held me back that much for whatever reason, because I, I, I just sort of was like, oh, well, you know, of course I'm going to be scared. I'm a scaredy cat. But, but what I've come to see that is so different. So when I first used to be scared, I thought it was just what I had to put up with. Then I learned self-empowerment and personal development and NLP and I could conquer fear and I could be the 40 foot Puma and, and I did all this stuff and it helped, but I was still fundamentally terrified of my own shadow. It's just that I could get past it. At a certain point, I realized fear is just made of thought. It's thought appearing real. We talk about false evidence appearing real. It's just thought. If we have a scary thought and we don't recognize that it's a thought, we're scared. So we think about a scary future, not realizing that we're just, we're scared of the thought, not the thing. Because there is no future. You ever notice it? It never shows up. But I can scare myself with imaginary ones. And, and when you start to see, okay, fear is not an enemy that has to be conquered. It's actually... I don't know if I'd go all the way to calling it a friend, but I'd go pretty far towards calling it a friend. It's like a rumble strip at the side of the road that you're falling asleep at the wheel. Like, so you're driving along and you're kind of like, and you're getting into your head and it stops the car from going off the road. And if you see that that's what it is, that's its gift. It's just saying, hey, the way you're thinking right now is really scary. You might want to stop doing that. And so it's not telling us about the world. It's telling us about real-time feedback on the content of our head, on, 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 on what that inner voice is doing right now. And even if you never hear the voice, even if you never see the thought, if you know that it's thought, well, you don't have to do anything about it because there'll be another thought along in a minute. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Brilliant advice, Michael. Uh, who inspires you now? What are you... What are you um... What are you currently more involved in reading more of or kind of, um, is, there, is there anything in particular that, that is? Um, yeah, I mean, mind? I'm, I'm really enjoying some of the, the, um, the, the, the kind of uh, classics, in, in, but different classics to the, you know, I used to, I love the Napoleon Hill stuff and all that, but classics like I've, I've suddenly can read Eckhart Tolle. Like I used to find him so boring. Yeah. And, and like all of a sudden, I, I guess I've slowed down enough to be able to listen to him. So I've been really enjoying his work. I, I, um, I love the Sid Bank stuff. Um, I, I probably read those books a dozen times each and I go back to them again and again. Uh, I'm enjoying some of Robert Holden's stuff. Uh, he, he, he and I have been great friends for 15 years. We met you know, we, we went out to dinner with Paul one night and he forgot his wallet and I had to pay and I've never let him forget it. I'm publicly <laughs> shame him wherever I can, but, but like we've been friends ever since. And, and, and I actually love his work, which is all, it's all about really finding the practical in the spiritual and the spiritual and the practical. Um, so that's, that's, that's what I'm loving. Brilliant. I, I actually remember I, I, I listened to, I, I, I was, I was pretty much one of the first ones on, on Audible when Audible.com came out before yeah. Audible.co. And I remember listening to Eckhart Tolle. That was like 12, 15 years ago. So I might go and revisit that one. And obviously with his German accent, well, his accent he has, which was quite strong, it was difficult to stay focused. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I get that. Uh, Robert is, 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 is a great guy. And one of the things that I, that I really talk about, uh, well, and I, and I mean this with love. And I know love's a big thing and I want to talk about love with you as well before we, we, we finish, but it is about being congruent. I, I do feel that there's a lot of people that are, you know, I, I normally say with love, I say to them, a lot of them should read their own books because oh, you yeah. Know, yeah, they're, they're really well written. It's a great idea, but you know, <laughs> Hey, how about implementing some? So, I mean, talking about Robert, you know, he, he is a guy that's extremely congruent. You know, he's uh, for me, he, he, he is, it, I, I feel that, that we need a lot more of that. I feel that we need a, a lot of more congruency, honesty, and, mm -hmm. and we need a lot more love. And, and, and I combine those things together because I really believe that at the end of the day, 
at the end of the day, what we're all ultimately looking for is, is, is for love. And I think the invitation, what you just said, is, is really a part of the invitation of the moment right now. And the invitation is stop talking about this shit and start being it. Mm. Or if you're already being it some of the time, be it more. Because it's really good stuff. We, we don't need more talking right now. We need more being. And, and, and I, I say that to myself too. Yeah, like, absolutely. <laughs> it, 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 it's, but that is the invitation. That is the opportunity to, to be less full of shit today than you were yesterday. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and being grateful uh, for what we have and embracing what we have, because, you know, this is either the time and the opportunity to do a lot of the things that we probably didn't do. But again, you know, probably half of the planet, if not more, would give whatever they have, which is nothing and to have what we have will be where we are. No. Yeah. And, and, and it's one of those ones where I, I, I was this is very I'm going very left field here, but this is what came <laughs> into my head is is I think it was Voltaire. The French philosopher who is a famous atheist who on his deathbed called for Catholic last rites. And, and when somebody said, I thought you were an atheist, he said, I'm just in case. <laughs> right? and, and there's something about that, like, we don't know what's coming. So now's not a bad time to appreciate what we got, no matter what. If things go great, great. You'll have even more to appreciate. And if they don't, you'll be really grateful you took the time to be really grateful. Well, Michael, I, I love it. And I think I'm pretty much going to end with that. Any last message, anything you want to share, anything in particular that you, you want to put out there? I, I mean, I think we've, we, we, we do, we have kind of covered it. I think the only thing that I would, I would remind everybody is if you're hurting right now, that's okay. Like it's not weird, but it's also not permanent and it's not the way it's going to be until the world changes. And, and if, if you can come out of this with any kind of hope at all, that's the best. That's all you need. That, 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 that in any moment, you're one thought away from being back to your most creative self, your most upbeat self, your, your, your most present self. And, and knowing that no matter how bad it seems, you're never more than one thought away from that it is literally the most comforting thing that I know. Michael, thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your wisdom, your generosity. And um, I want to thank everyone else for watching, listening, inspiring people with Michael Neal. Thank you, Michael. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Okay. God bless. All the best. Take care. Bye. Thank you, everyone. For more information, go to www.thebestyou.co.